Right. You have to excuse me, I'm riding the caffeine and chalky biscuit high like the rest of you, so we're doing this together, we're going to be fine. Um, so, thank you for, uh, for letting me speak and for staying to this part of the afternoon of the conference. It's always a worry when you get the penultimate talk, it's like, is it going to be an empty room? Uh, I'm Jen Jackson, I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the York Archaeological Trust, based uh, within the Jorvik Group Attractions uh, in York. Um, for those of you who don't know us, York Archaeological Trust is a somewhat unique organisation. We're probably most famous for our uh, five attractions, most famous of which is Jorvik. We also have uh, Barley Hall, Richard III, Henry VII, uh, medieval attractions, and Dig, an archaeological adventure. Uh, this is an interactive museum where people can come along and have a go at excavation and sorting, uh, sorting uh, finds. Just as a, a brief indication, so I've got an idea, has anyone ever visited Dig? Can I have a hand up? Yeah, a few, okay. So that's only one small part of the York Archaeological Trust. Uh, there are 200 people who are employed by the Trust across uh, six different um, areas of the business. We have four contracting fieldwork units. We have uh, Trenton Peak in Nottingham, Ark Heritage in Sheffield, Northlight up in Glasgow, and uh, Yat in, in the York office. We also have a conservation lab, also based in York, and a research institute called Inherit up in Glasgow as well. So we're a wide and varied um, organisation. Uh, this talk has been uh, quite pressing because I joined YAT uh, in, on the 7th of November 2016, so tomorrow is my yat anniversary uh, for two years in, in post. Um, and I took on this new post, uh, which was, was an entirely new post when I, when I took it. Um, and I was given a, a sort of interesting task of considering how we can bring more of the public presentation work, and we like to think world-leading expertise in public presentation, to our field work uh, offer and, and the commercial side of our um, business and organisation. I arrived uh, being a, a practising professional archaeologist who'd been employed to do archaeology for 14 years. So I thought when I started this job that I I knew a bit about heritage interpretation and how to talk to the public about the past. I very quickly learned in uh, the 12 weeks it took me to get up to speed before we launched the New Yorvik um, that I know very little about talking to the public about the past uh, despite all of that experience and that I had a lot to learn about what it meant to be a heritage interpreter rather than an archaeologist and that these two things are not necessarily always the same thing, in fact rarely. And I think this rather ego uh, testing experience mm -hmm. Um, is something that I have benefited from and is something that I'm trying to explain to all of my fieldwork colleagues across the organisation. There's very much a feeling within our organisation that the archaeologists are the active, exciting Indiana Jones types doing the archaeology, whereas those working within the museums are, by their nature, a bit more passive, a bit more static, stuff happens slower. Um, which is not, I can promise you, the case, as you all know, within the museum setting. Um, so that's kind of part of the challenge that I've been set um, with, within this uh, piece of work that I'm bringing. The other part of the challenge um, is looking at what it means to be involved as a member of the public, as a community engagement manager. I will eventually ban the word community because I don't like it. What does it mean? Who are they? Mm -hmm. Public is the word I'm trying to, to, to replace it with. Um, but what does it mean for a member of the public to take part in archaeology? What does it mean to be engaged in this process? We have, um, we have two models within the trust of what public engagement in archaeology looks like. The first is a traditional community archaeology-based approach where you bring people onto site. They're either paying to be there to take part through part of their training or, or learning to be an archaeologist, or they're part of some community group, whatever that is, who are involved in primary data gathering um, work. Or we have this museum interaction where people come as a visitor to what, although we think very exciting and engaging experience within our museum, is still quite a passive experience. You are engaging as, um, as, a, as an observer. You're taking part, you're digging, you're inter intervening, but you're not contributing to the process of what it is we're learning about the sum of total knowledge about archaeology. There is assumption that community archaeology, in, in that phrase, and you talk at community archaeology conferences, community archaeology is about gathering data. We're obsessed with gathering data, whether it's field walking, 
geophysics or excavation. It's all about finding out new stuff. Or the other form of engagement, if you're taking part in archaeology, is going to look at it passively in a case behind glass. Those at the moment, it seems to me, to be the two models of engagement that you can take part in archaeology. Uh, I would um, suggest that this talk has been the process of two years thinking, and these are ideas that I'm still voicing for the first time to you at the moment, and it's something, a, a journey that I have been through, so I am I would hesitate to say that uh, this is a finished piece of thinking, I don't think it is, um, but I would very much recommend the work of uh, Dr Sarah Perry at the University of York on her work in uh, the role of uh, heritage interpreters within fieldwork teams and uh, on archaeological sites, and the need to employ archaeological uh, interpreters as part of the fieldwork process. And it's kind of building on those thoughts and ideas that I've been uh, trying to think about more. Is there room within our museum <coughs> environment, within our attractions environment, to do community archaeology, to have community participation in this thing we call archaeology? Or is it that there, it's too difficult, it's too static? What is the process that we go through when we're doing museum archaeology? Isn't it archaeology? Isn't it an active process that we are taking part of and displaying to the project? Public, rather. What do the objects and the archives that we are always, always digging up and finding more and publishing more and more great literature reports, what do they actually mean? And what do they, um, what is it that we're trying to communicate to the public by displaying them to them? And what is it the response that we want to generate in that person who is observing? There has to be another way. There has to be uh, more options to just finding more data or looking at it in a case. As I say, this is the first time I'm vocalising and trying to put these ideas into a succinct way. Um, I've been uh, quite fortunate in that um, my role is, is core funded, so I've had this two year process to go through to, to generate these ideas and thinking and to try these projects that I'm going to uh, show you, the, the sum total of my two years work to show what I've done. Um, which is a fortunate uh, uh, position to be in. <coughs> so the ideas, what I've sort of solidified, I think, my thinking process over the last two years, is what I'm trying to express and to enact in the work that I'm doing, is that experts don't have all the answers. Yes, we are very privileged to understand the code and the technique about how you find archaeology, and we understand the code and the technique behind how we present it to the public, doesn't necessarily mean we're right or that we have the only right to express opinions or uh, to say what it means to the person who is stood there looking at it. They could find completely different meaning or completely different interpretation. So what we're trying to do is open up a, 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 a safe space, I suppose, to explore the archaeological evidence, to show the data that has been gathered and the obsession of the evidence that we've been collecting for years and years and to show the process that we go through to explore that data and come to the understanding and the decisions that we make about <coughs> it. We want to create space to enable individual responses to that evidence to find meaning. That is the true purpose of what meaning and field engagement means. We want people to think and to feel about these objects and come to their own conclusions. And it seems to me that the best way to do that is involve them in that process uh, and then working out see where we get to. Another key important part of this is to work in collaboration or partnership. It feels very strongly to us that we can't do this on our own, um, and nor should we. We are merely facilitators in this process, uh, and that actually other people probably have a stronger uh, and um, just as equal claim to, to authority and, and knowledge about the evidence that we are examining. And another key aim is to use imagination and creativity to bring archaeology alive. Learning about the past doesn't have to just be about neatly sitting in rows and listening to people speaking. You can learn in lots of different ways that the vast majority of the population would run screaming from this room and wouldn't be sat in the first place, or would have gone maybe two days ago. Um, so what is the other way that you learn? It's through imagination and creativity. That is what generates emotion, generates engagement, and generates connection with the past and trying to elicit the, the feelings and thoughts that we're trying to express. So these are the principles that I've been trying to enact in the, the projects that I'm going to show you. Uh, the idea expressly has been to try and work with uh, non-traditional museum visiting audiences to try and find 
um, ways of working with people in different and collaborative ways that engage people on their own terms rather than on mine. Again, I'm fortunate in that I'm not working with funding bodies, I have been working with various different funding bodies, but uh, as, as an overarching project, I've not had to set out my aims and objectives at the beginning and then demonstrate how clever I've been at meeting them to meet the funding yeah. bodies. Hey, yeah. um, I've made mistakes and deviated a lot in the last two years, again, which is a very privileged position to be able to be in. Um, so, um, the space we did, I say we've been working with funders in different ways. So, although my post is funding, we did have some money when I started um, this, this process uh, from the Arts Council Resilience uh, Fund to enhance our community uh, exhibition space. So, we uh, spent that money on creating, turning one of the three galleries that is in DIG uh, into a community exhibition space. We invested in two cases, three large wall panels, uh, a tactile table display a very large screen and an audio station, which are all the fixed features that will be in this space. Um, this audio station, we've, we've also uh, focused quite, ex we've done quite a lot of work on access as a different separate project. Um, and this uh, audio station always has a full audio interpretation, uh, 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 sorry, audio description of the exhibition uh, part in there as well. So we're very lucky to have this space within our museum. And we like to think this is a two-way mirror. The rest of the attraction is about the visitor experiencing what we as YAT uh, can, can offer and show and, and teach about what archaeology is and how you take part and how, what it is to experience it. In this space, um, it's you, dear visitor, can tell us what you want to see in this space. It's about how you or someone quite like you can also investigate archaeology. Um, and we do have areas where people can um, make suggestions of where perhaps future projects that might go into this space. So I'll rapidly go through. We've uh, launched, uh, this has all say, been in quite a short, short, short time scale. Uh, we've had three exhibitions so far, uh, and I'm working on the fourth, which will launch in January. The pace is a bit crazy, is what I'm going to say. As I say, this idea that uh, we work slow and sedately and within the museum division doesn't really work. So I'll give you a snapshot of three exhibitions that we've done so far, and then some of the thoughts of um, where I'm going next with this. So we started... Um, with, uh, because we were still uh, using this resilience fund uh, uh, pot of money uh, to create this exhibition space, the first exhibition we put in it um, met some of the aims for that resilience funding about working with local volunteer-led museums and sharing our skills and expertise with the wider sector. So we worked with a museum called Southburn Archaeological Museum, which is a fantastic volunteer-led museum, which literally has one of everything, from Mesolithic all the way through, neatly documented and displayed to the public, open through the summer. Um, it's put together based on uh, a collection made by this gentleman. This is Brian Hebblewhite, who is a tractor driver uh, from the, the farm at Southburn, who lived in one of the Thai costumes from the 1960s until his death in the 1990s. And he collected all of the material that's in this museum. This is the map, he's the hand-drawn beautiful map that he had made um, on this, uh, on, of his collection. Um, and he just used to pick it up as he was powering it along the field, literally one of everything, whereas uh, this uh, the story <coughs> is um, one of the Iron Age chalk figurines um, uh, which have been decapitated, one of the uh, chalk warrior figures, uh, which are a very iconic East Yorkshire find. Uh, there's even one of them in this collection, it's literally one of everything. Um, the volunteers were brilliant, but what they wanted to know, and we asked them if we want to work together, what is it that you would like to get from us? What do you want to draw from us? And they said they felt that their, in their museum, it was very much a linear time-based interpretation. It literally goes from uh, Mesolithic, I say, through to everything neatly listed with their dates aligned. What they wanted to explore was more about storytelling, about explaining how this collection came together and what it actually means to the people who live there. So we worked with the, the volunteers and also we did oral history work with, uh, with uh, Brian's wife and daughter and his wife as a character. She was amazing. The, the, the stories that, you can, that she told about this uh, gentleman. And he went on, they worked um, as a family, they worked on this project to collect all this material and eventually got involved in local archaeology groups and did um, uh, night school sort of sessions and carried out their own excavations on a Saturday, just the three of them, with a caravan out the back of the garden uh, and excavated a renowned British settlement, as you do, um, at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the detail, the records they created are absolutely stunning. But we did a lot of oral history work about the volunteers as well, and we expressed and explored with them 
what these objects meant and why it is that they give their free time and their, their dedication to this museum. Um, so this is the, the final exhibition and all of the resources that we put into this, we created 3D tactile uh, artistic representations to explore the, the figurines. All of this material has since uh, come out of the exhibition and has gone to the site. Oh dear, throw water at the computer. Um, it, it's all gone to the museum, so it's uh, it's had a life beyond its its space within this exhibition space. It's now gone on, gone on uh, to live in the South Bernard Logical Museum and augment their interpretation. So that was our first exploring exploration of a co-curated exhibition. What it meant to work with a partner and to explore different stories and different voices that weren't yet interpretation. It wasn't our uh, interpretation of what was going on in this space. So the second project um, was Your Dig Tang Hall. Uh, we worked with Tang Hall Big Local, which is part of the, uh, Tang Hall, uh, part of the local, uh, the National Lottery Big Local Trust uh, Fund. I've lost what that is. Um, and they have money, a pot of money to spend on this particular area in York, which is one of the most deprived areas um, in, in the city uh, to make it the best place to, to live and work. And they wanted us to do a project. They approached us uh, that explored the heritage and the culture of the area. So we, uh, we picked uh, randomly um, a subject because we had to come up with something uh, at this point. And we worked with, um, with the with the, 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 the funder to pick this project, but this is uh, Excavations at Apple Tree Farm, which is in just not a uh, sort of a five minute walk from the community centre <coughs> the project is based at, which was excavated in the 1960s and again in the 80s and 90s by uh, the university, which has never been published. And the material is still under the bed of the excavator who did it. Uh, so we did a whole engagement project, including the school's work. We did a pottery survey. I spent time uh, at the, the library, the local co-op, the allotments with my collection of Roman pots, uh, getting people to think about the material that they would have under their feet. And I got really interesting response about how this, um, this material is, is archaeology, something that lives in the city. It it's, lives in museums in the city, and it's for visitors. It's not for us, people who live here in York. And it's, it's nothing really to do with us. <laughs> Why are you here? Um, very confused with me and the pottery and co-op on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so it was a really interesting response about what the ownership of this pottery was. So we then, um, I didn't tell you what it, why it was pottery, I just remember that the kiln site that um, what was ex, this is moving, I don't know why. Um, the pottery, um, the kiln site was excavated, uh, was part of, we think a military kiln, part of the, um, uh, on the road out of York, was the key part, I forgot to tell you about that, which is why we picked pottery. So we did this uh, three pottery sessions uh, where we worked with Graham Taylor, who's a fantastic uh, potter, to create these fantastic uh, creative representations of face pots that would have been made at this kiln. There are face pots from this excavation um, in this area. And there was a real sense of connection with people making these pots in this community centre, literally a stone's throw from where this kiln was excavated and found. And the connection is determined to show you the, the answers to this. Um, so we were lucky enough then to take these pots to Vindolando and we took some of the participants who had made them up with us and fired them in a kiln and we were able to carry out some real hard archaeological science. That's me uh, touching the edge of the kiln, firing these pots, and the thermometer, you can't read, reads uh, 715 degrees centigrade. We were showing, we filmed this whole process and um, showing the, the insulating properties of clay and how efficient these uh, kilns were. I wouldn't want to do that with my oven, <laughs> be that close if it was up at that kind of temperature. So as part of this, we were exploring not only the connection to the local space, the industry that was involved, um, but also the archaeological science and the evidence of how we gather data and how we know material. So this was our final exhibition that we installed uh, that was over the summer. Um, and it, um, we also were able to work with the local archaeologist who had excavated the site in the 1990s. And we got a lot of the material from the kiln site, working with him directly on display for the first time, which had never been seen within the city. We also managed to make a link to um, the pottery. We were excavating at that time as yet in the fieldwork team, uh, a cemetery site uh, across the other side of York, which had pottery in it that we believed to have been made in our kiln site in Apple Tree Farm. So we, will be able, we were able to tell the life story of this pot traveling across York and show, show all the stages of archeology span as it's come through. So again, that was our other model. That was one quite an early project and had less, um, Com uh, community participation in the generating of the theme, that one. I think that was while we were originally working out the model 
and we spent a lot of time with that one working about the methodology about how we get people involved and how we make connections with local visitors. Although we did have 54 local residents from Tanghorn making pottery, so I didn't think it was a, wasn't that bad on that one. So Converge is the final project I'm going to tell you about, which is what's in at the moment. This uh, we launched in September. So Converge is um, Converge is a partnership project from the University of York. No, sorry, from York St John University and a consortium of local mental statutory mental health services within the city. It's a program of arts education that people with, who use statutory mental health services can uh, access free of charge to help their, in their recovery. So we worked with various tutors with Converge uh, who'd expressed an interest in working with us. And we uh, worked with different groups, particularly one group uh, of this program called Discover Museums, which the idea of this uh, particular group was encouraging people with severe mental health uh, challenges to reconnect with what we might call normal life culture within the city. Going to visit uh, museums can be a challenging experience if you are facing those kinds of challenges. So we spent time with these uh, people and we, um, we talked to them about what it is they wanted to know and we selected a site uh, that was literally the car park outside the university uh, called Union Terrace, which is the co main coach site for, for York. It was excavated in 1972 by Yat, and um, it's a normal grey literature, very boring report uh, with normal boring archaeology that has been excavated, written up and put in the stores and never thought of again. So we got it out and we thought, okay, what, what will we do? So we spent time with, the, with the, the participants in this particular course and we did some sense of place workshops. We walked around this area and imagined what the, this area would have been like in the past. And we looked <coughs> in real close date, detail at the um, textures and, and uh, um, physical surroundings uh, to experience and ground in sort of yourself in a sense of place about what it is this place looks like today. These are some of the participants' photographs that we did in that workshop. We then looked at the material and we did a, a fine handling, fairly standard uh, exercise, looking at these objects and the run-of-the-mill material that had been excavated. But then we took a step back and the participants looked at these objects and they separated them into these themes, <coughs> these pattern shapes, re religions, meaning family, pastimes, home life, decoration, trade, water, and cooking. And they began to write very movingly about what these themes meant. I didn't give them these themes, this is what they decided on. And they wrote very movingly about what these um, what these words meant to them, what these objects meant to them, and what stories they felt that belonged to them. So this group um, wrote the exhibition. Every piece of text that you will see, and I'll show you the final exhibition, have come from this group. It is not Yat's voice, it is not an expert voice. And it's been quite a fun experience curating this with my curator, curator, curation team, who um, or very uncomfortable with the amount of certainty and definition and um, uh, uh, depiction of fact that they felt was too strong in a lot of what people were saying and in the interpretation. And we said, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say that. We would, we would caveat it. We'd make it more ambiguous. And I, thought, I know, but it's not your voice. Um, was something I had to say again and again and again and again. And in the end, I had to give way. And there is a little tiny information uh, board that's at the bottom of a case with uh, catalogue labels and proper, um, what they would yeah. describe as proper uh, labels uh, for the fines. But the fines labels that are on the case, again, are all written by the participants uh, and express what they believe that these objects are. <laughs> we then did other workshops um, with a creative, uh, many creative courses, including creative writing, songwriting, uh, art groups, and this theatre group, um, where people created a creative response, <coughs> again, following a fines <coughs> <coughs> session, um, they, they created their own work. And I'll never forget being in the theatre uh, workshop where I was demonstrating there's a, it being York, there's one of everything from this site, from Roman to Viking to medieval. There's a medieval hospital, there's a school where Guy Fawkes went to school. Um, it goes on and on, what's, what's on this very boring <laughs> York uh, site. Um, there was a quernstone, and I was demonstrating to them what a quernstone is and how it works, a Viking quernstone. And one person started moving, and I ended up showing them how you make a quernstone. And another person started moving, and suddenly they were all dancing. And they was making a dance about a quernstone. And it was the most extraordinary response to a fine handling session that I have ever experienced. <laughs> the, the resulting theatre production is up on the website. If you have a look at the dig uh, website, the <coughs> theatre and the song that was written uh, is all up there. So 
this is the resulting fully, I think this type of one is, this is it. This is our first fully co-curated exhibition. This is not our voice. This is a uh, participatory interpretation is what I like to frame this as. This is people taking part in archaeology, doing community archaeology without discovering new data and interpreting the past in a new way that has never been seen before. So what's next? Uh, so uh, next Monday I'm off with um, a group of A-level chemistry and biology students cooking in the Viking style, smashing pots and ex extracting lipids uh, from the pottery to analyse them, as you do. That's next week's challenge. And we're working with the University of York uh, on their melting pot project about lipid analysis and genetic uh, identification of lipids to see what we can tell about Viking cooking uh, is the project I'm working on next. And then following that, as part of some wider work that I'm doing on the heritage, uh, heritage research strategy for the Yorkshire Wolds, we're working um, as part of the public engagement programme for that with Bishop Burton Agricultural College to work with agricultural students on plough technology and how plough interfaces um, uh, are impacting on uh, heritage at risk within the Yorkshire Wolds. And the plan is to, to explore different types of ploughing technique with those students. So they're the, the projects that I'm working on at the moment, which will go through into exhibition next year. So as I've said, I, um, I continue to expouse these, these five principles of what being involved in community engagement within an archaeological museum means and what it can mean. But what I would like to develop and what I think I am trying to develop, though I'm not completely certain yet, um, is a model of participatory interpretation. I use participatory in a, in a colloquial form rather than with its academic baggage. Um, but this fact that community engagement doesn't have to be just about gathering more data or just about looking at something in a passive way. There is a way of engaging people in the process, the thoughts, feelings, generating the thoughts, feelings and emotions that we associate with objects and that this... Um, model is a way of expressing that and that museums are the right place for that to be taking part in um, they are a space in which um, people understand what the remit of the, a museum is um, it can be quite a safe experience compared to the challenges of bringing people onto commercial archaeological excavations um, so in, in, as, a, as a sort of comparison of where this kind of model might take place it also, um, having an exhibition as an outcome, I could have done all these engagement projects without an exhibition. It would have been lovely, we'd have had a nice time, we'd have taken pro 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 photographs, and you know, it would have been on social media, it would have been lovely. But somehow, the exhibition is the MacGuffin, it's the why we're doing it, and it's why people are taking part, and it validates that taking part, and displays to others, uh, that the people taking part and the views and opinions being expressed in this ex exhibition become authentic, they become real, they become authorita uh, uh, an authority because they're in this exhibition space. So I think the exhibition is a key part of these engagement pro projects and, and the other way around. I think the pro you can't do an exhibition like this without the project, if that makes sense. So uh, just as I finish my, my personal journey, as I've been explaining, uh, I came from, come from being a professional archaeologist. I still consider myself a professional archaeologist. But the last two years have been a journey about what it means to express and interpret archaeology. And archaeology doesn't have to just be about data gathering. There is a lot more to it. But we sometimes just show off and call post -ex, um, and put that in a box over there. Um, and I would suggest that if we're talking about assertive action, that actually reclaiming what archaeology means and what it means to engage in archaeology and to actively take part in archaeology and being the, part of the interpretive process in this way is, is open to anybody and everybody in this room and we can all do it. Go.